and welcome in episode number one of the 2021 best podcast available. Never mind the fact we had a couple postseason podcasts. That was part of the 2020 season. This is 2021 and Gribble 10 weeks from today. It is the NFL draft. Hard to believe it is coming fast. Normally we start this a little earlier, but with the playoffs ending, gotta gotta get a couple weeks to to get reconfigured, get back into the facility, and get back at it here as we start to break down this off season. Look ahead to the off season, but also look ahead to a, a draft that's going to happen here in Cleveland, we think, and a draft where the Browns aren't picking in the top ten, not even in the top twenty. Pick number twenty six. Yeah, yeah. This off season is is all sorts of different. I mean, first off the fact that the draft is only 10 weeks away is, is kind of crazy. I mean, and, and as we tape today, I mean, free agency is less than a month away. And, and I think that's the perks of playing in the playoffs. Your, your off season doesn't get started until the, the middle of January. I mean, this was a late end to the season to begin with. I mean, we're playing after New Year's day uh, for the right to end the regular season, but you know, you play a couple more weeks and all of a sudden you got a shorter off season calendar. The difference though, is you don't have the same tent pole events that you normally do in the off season to kind of pace your way through that. So at the same time for me, 10 weeks seems like a short amount of time, but it's also a long amount of time because we just don't have that combine breaking things up and, and helping out our schedule a little bit. So sad. So sad. I, and we'll talk a little bit more about no NFL combine later on in the program coming up on this edition of the best podcast available. Uh, our third round pick from last year, one of our third round picks from last year, linebacker Jacob Phillips, no longer a rookie, now a seasoned veteran heading into year number two. He will join us coming up in just a few minutes to talk about his draft process, advice to this year's class as they get ready to go through the gauntlet that is getting ready for that day that comes up 10 weeks from now. We'll also talk about the combine, recap the senior bowl a little bit and have a little fun with a, with a three round mock that uh, eh, is a little different as usual here on the best podcast available. Gribs uh, pick number 26 for us, which means you're picking toward the back in every round. Uh, nine picks in the 2021 draft. Biggest challenges you see with picking it at pick number 26, other than we really don't have an idea of players at this point and who stands out and who might be a player that the Browns are targeting right now. Yeah, and I think it's it's both a, it's a good and a, and a tough thing because first off, you're in this position at 26 because your team's good, and I think that's the that that's what happens when you have a good team is that you, you draft later. And this is the normal thing that good teams do. I, I think that the second thing is when you get toward that 26 area, you start going into that first round. Uh, I'm, I'm already starting to think about this is, are you going to make that pick? Because that's, that's the part of the draft where you see a lot of movement uh, because you see teams trying to move out of there because they can get more picks and you see tr uh, teams trying to move into that area to get some more players that they can control for five years. And I, I think that, so that's something we'll keep an eye on. And I think when you're that low in the draft and after you have, especially the college football season that we just had, where a lot of these top prospects weren't even playing, you just don't have the same kind of clarity with what the Browns might do at number 26, outside of the fact that we're pretty sure they're probably gonna take a defensive player. But at, at that point, I mean, it's, it's just totally up in the air. And I, I think we've just gone into these drafts for the last 20 years, the majority of the time, early picks with a clear understanding of what position's being targeted. You even look at last year, number 10 pick, pretty confident the Browns were taking a tackle because they really needed, needed a tackle and the draft was, was strong in tackles. Now at 26, it, it's truly anything can go, even though we do think it'll be focused on one side of the ball. Yeah, I, I would like to think so, but I mean, it, you can draft for need at 26 or you can draft best player available at 26. There, I mean, yeah. especially if four or five quarterbacks go a lot higher than maybe a lot of people originally thought they might, all that does is bump that draft list down and uh, the, those players at those other positions that, uh, you know, similar to what happened last year with Harrison Bryant just falling and the Browns 
you know, as Andrew Barry said, we really couldn't pass on him at that draft spot. Maybe we were looking at another position, but when Harrison Bryant kept falling, it was one of those where you, you'd be foolish not to take a man of that caliber and that talent. Yeah, I mean, I, I again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet a, a, a single thing on saying the Browns are going to take a defensive player at number twenty six because they they could just follow the board and you and you could go offense. I mean, it's just we just look at the roster as it stands now. The offensive side of the ball, almost everyone is coming back, and the offense just happened to be very good last year. The defense, half your starters are free agents. Uh, a lot of depth players as well uh, are are up for free agency. And the defense struggled at times, especially with yardage. They were good at turnovers, not very good in total yards, things of that nature, not very good uh, against the pass. So it, it leads to some obvious early conclusions. And I think early analysis of this draft favors a defensive player at that portion of the draft. There's a lot of good players uh, that could be available. But again, I think anything is up for grabs at, at 26. I mean, look what the Packers did in that range last year. A, a team that is a, was a, maybe a, a player away from the Super Bowl drafted a backup quarterback. I mean, it's just, there, there's a lot that you, you can't really pigeon yourself in pigeonhole yourself in anything. I mean, look at the chiefs did. I don't know if anyone thought they were just going to take a running back with that last pick in the first round. So a, a lot on the table. And, and again, at 26, you're at the mercy of all those teams in front of you that can make those moves and, and take some players that you think are going to be there, but there's really no one you can safely assume is going to be there at 26. Yeah. We'll start to break all of that down and start figuring out the players put the names with the positions and try to figure some things out here over the next 10 weeks as we get closer to draft day here in the city of Cleveland. Uh, I do want to talk about real quick before we are joined by linebacker Jacob Phillips, and that's this Browns 2020 rookie class. You know, you and I talked a lot about it leading up to the draft. The pandemic had started right after the combine. The world seemed to end right after the combine. All of a sudden, we're at home. We're trying to piece together. We knew they were going to go offensive lineman at number 10. They end up getting Jedrick Wills. And then this draft really just fell into place in an unbelievably good way for this front office and for this coaching staff. And I don't think you can say enough, not just for the job that Andrew Barry and his crew did in getting ready for the draft and then drafting, but the job that these players did, Wills, Elliott, Phillips, Bryant, Harris, Donovan Peoples-Jones, and of course, Grant Delpit, who we look forward, who will essentially be a rookie here in 2021. But the job that those guys did and the part that they played in this team having the success that it did can't be understated. Yeah, and it's interesting because I think we all look back in that 2018 draft, which was a foundational draft for this franchise and that you got potentially three franchise cornerstone players in Baker Mayfield, Denzel Ward, and Nick Chubb. But I can make the argument that this was maybe the most balanced draft class in terms of immediate production you got out of everyone. It seemed like all six of those guys who were able to play made meaningful con contributions to you throughout the season. I mean, Jedrick Wills started almost every game at left tackle. He's your guy moving forward. That, that's a successful pick in the first round. Delpit, we'll see what happens next year coming off the Achilles. But then the rest of those guys, I mean, third rounders, Jacob Phillips, who, who we'll talk to later, emerged as, your star, as a starter after battling through some injuries and really showed off a lot of speed and the kind of talent you're looking for. Jordan Elliott was a rotational player on the defensive line from day one. He contributed Harrison Bryant was a starting tight end all year in the fourth round. He contributed. Nick Harris was a backup center, but then had to play some meaningful snaps late in the season. He helped you out and, and you're excited about his future. And then Donovan Peoples-Jones, I mean, that's about as good as uh, of a sixth round wide receiver you're going to get with the upside and talent that he provided and was essentially this team's number three wide receiver for the entire second half of the season. And, and the arrow is pointing way up for him. So that's 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 getting that's getting contributions out of every member of your class. Whereas 2018, you had some superstar players, but you weren't getting something out of everyone in that 2018 class. I mean, this was just balance uh, across the board, and I, I think bodes well for for the future of this team if you can continue to do that, sprinkling in a couple of those guys, those superstar type players. I mean, that that's good drafting. What about uh, most surprising rookie on this football team from 2020? You know, I would say to me, I, I think Harrison Bryant surprised me the most in the fact that he emerged and took over as a starter pretty much from week one. Because I think 
as much, as excited as I was at, about how talented he was, I didn't expect him to be as good as he was, especially in training camp where he really showed out. And I just look at tight end historically, and that's just a tough position to play as a rookie. I mean, it's just not one you see a lot of immediate contributions. I mean, the, the, the stat that blew me away during the Super Bowl was that a guy like Travis Kelsey is the same age as Gronk. And I think that, that you, you just think of that because Travis Kelsey came on the radar, but it, it took some time. He overcame an injury. And, and to really become who Travis Kelsey is, it takes some time. And for Harrison Bryant to, to do what he did as a rookie, a fourth round rookie at that, at tight end, I mean, he was the league's best rookie tight end. And I, I think that, that that kind of production out of a fourth round tight end is just not common. And I think it bodes well for what he can do in the, in the future. And you always see what these rookie tight ends look like. And then when they look like in their fifth or sixth year, it's like they took, they turned into the incredible Hulk. I mean, these guys get bigger, they adapt their bodies. And I'll be interested to see what Harrison Bryant looks like over these next couple of years, because I think he's really going to grow and develop into someone who you can really count on. You know, with Harrison Bryant and also with Donovan Peoples Jones, maybe the two most impressive things or the most impressive thing that the two of them did was their blocking. Like, you know, I, yeah. I think that was, we weren't sure what was going to happen with Bryant and blocking, you know, it's a rookie. Can, how quickly can he pick it up technique wise and, and the NFL going up against a, a lot of, a lot of guys that are a lot faster than he went up against in college and the blocking and the job that they did both Bryant and people's Jones uh, something to be said for that. And, and uh, it goes without saying, I mean, Jedrick Wills, maybe we're grading him on a, on a curve because he's the first round pick, but the fact that like he was making the switch from right tackle to left tackle with no real off season, none of that. And we really didn't have any of those kind of, growing pain moments. I mean, there were some, some unfortunate penalties here and there, you know, he gave up a couple sacks here and there, but there wasn't really any kind of prolonged stretch where you're like, wow, that's a rookie at left tackle. I mean, that, that, so that's the biggest testament to what he was able to do. And I think it was great that he came into a, you can argue him and Tristan Wirfs probably entered into the two best situations out of any of these rookie offensive tackles. But, you know, look at what happened with Andrew Thomas and, and the Giants the number four pick in the draft, he got benched. I mean, so that, that those, those things happen. And for Jedrick Wills, the fact that we just didn't talk about him all that much this year shows how solid he was and, and how excited people should be because you're not supposed to talk about your left tackle. You're not supposed to talk about any of these offensive linemen. And I think Jedrick Wills succeeded in that regard. Well, the 2020 draft class, rookies, no more. They are now veterans. And, and to get a little perspective uh, on what it's like to go through the rookie process, especially as a pandemic it is really kicking up and things are changing on the fly. Uh, our new, our new, our second year linebacker, third round pick from 2020, Jacob Phillips spent a few minutes with us, wanted to pick his brain on the process, his advice to this year's class and the kids that are coming out and get his thoughts on the 2020 season, what he's working on for 2021. Have a watch, have a listen. Happy to be joined now on the best podcast available by Brown's second year, second year, no more rookie label, no more rookie label. Jacob Phillips joins us here on the podcast and Jacob, congratulations. You made it through the rookie year. I know how the rookie season goes in terms of from the time you stopped playing and you won a national championship at LSU, going straight through essentially till the third week in January of 2021 through a pandemic, through everything else. It's been a gauntlet. How nice is it to finally catch your breath and get a chance to get a little R&R? &R? Yeah, it's, it's actually kind of weird, you know, because like you said, going from, from national championship game straight, I left the, the next day to go to training. And then, uh, you know, training, getting ready for the uh, combine, doing that. And then, uh, you know, obviously getting ready for camp. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been uh, it's been actually kind of weird now that I can, you know, kind of calm down and, uh, you know, just kind of just chill a little bit, take a breath. And then, you know, I mean, obviously back to work, but, you know, it's, it's cool having that breath. And Jacob, you had to be among the many that just wanted to keep playing this year because you guys were doing so well. And and you in particular had taken on kind of a bigger role in the defense. What what was that like as as a rookie to kind of grow into a bigger and bigger role as the season went on? And and how excited does that make you going into your second season? Uh, yeah, you know, I just feel like I was fortunate, uh, you know, early in the season 
from really game one. I had my injury, was out uh, several weeks, and then, you know, came back and had another, like, just re-aggravated the injury, was out again for, uh, you know, I think I missed, like, eight weeks or nine weeks uh, during the season. So, you know, it was it was good, you know, being able to, I right, I'm playing some games and, uh, you know, keep on, keep on, you know, elevating, uh, you know, rather than, you know, earlier in the season, you know, I got hurt again. But, uh, you know, I definitely wanted to keep playing. You know, I feel like we had a special team this year and, uh, you know, we had, we had, we could have done a lot of great things. And, uh, you know, I'm grateful to be a part of, of that chapter, you know, sending us to the playoffs. But, you know, I feel like it's, it's, it's uphill from here. What's the biggest thing that you took away or learned from your rookie season? Uh, biggest thing is just, you know, that really just takes all of us, uh, you know, in college, it, it takes all of us, but it's, it's a little bit different. You know, we really, really rely on every single person that takes the field in the NFL. So cause it's, it's a game of inches and it, and it definitely gets even smaller in the NFL. So, you know, just realizing that every play is a big play. Uh, everything that you do is uh, can be pivotal, pivotal and uh, success in the game. So, you know, that's probably the biggest thing. And Jacob, I know a lot of college guys always talk about how different it is in the NFL having to watch film and, and watching it at a different level because you're just having to be so much smarter. And then with the COVID pandemic, you guys are probably doing so much more virtual, so much more film watching in general. I mean, how much, how much of a smarter player do you feel like you are after your rookie season having to go through all of that analysis of, and, and, and different ways of, of learning how to be better? Yeah, I think, I think I'm a whole lot smarter, uh, you know, coming from college. You know, watching film isn't isn't as you know, uh, it isn't as much of a big thing as you know. It's basically just you know everybody's going out and you know competing and uh, you know obviously there's scheme and all that, but you know NFL, we all know it's a different level and uh, you know it takes watching film. It takes you know being able to expect things to uh, you know have success in the NFL and you know I feel like as the season grew on, you know I got I got better at it and uh, you know I feel like uh, you know I can't wait to. You know, I feel like I got a good footing on it for next year. All right, let's go back to after that championship game at LSU and you're getting ready for the combine and the draft. Uh, the combine happens, the world basically comes to an end <laughs> and everything shuts down. What, what was your pre-draft process like uh, in those couple months leading up to the draft? Uh, you know, I, I enjoy mine. Uh, you know, I was in, I was in Dallas at Exos uh, training. Uh, you know, I liked everybody that I was training with, the coaches there. You know, I was having a, you know, extremely good time. And uh, you know, and then going to the combine, you know, it was a it was an experience that you know I'm gonna be forever grateful for. Uh, you know, just because you know you grow up watching it as a kid, and uh, you know that's just the, the point that you want to get to in your career at that point. And uh, then after that, we got back and everything kind of shut down. So, you know, I came home and uh, just trained here, worked out here, uh, you know, with my with my coaches here. And, uh, you know, I mean, I enjoyed it. You know, uh, all the new experiences, getting to talk to all the different coaches that, you know, you see on Sundays every week uh, growing up. And, you know, uh, you know, I enjoyed it. It was different, but I enjoyed it. What do you think about the fact that all these guys coming in this year won't have to go through what you did at the combine. Do you think that's a good thing or what do you, would you wish they had to go through what you had to, had to go through? Uh, nah, I mean, that's, that's just, that's just the way it goes. Uh, you know, I mean, the combine was, was definitely a, a different experience, you know, having to compete and run, do all that at 11 o'clock at night, you know, uh, is, I mean, it is what it is. Everybody got to do it you know, except for this class, but I mean, it, it all doesn't really matter, you know, once you get drafted and once you get to a team and, uh, you know, you start learning the play, start learning the way that they want you to, uh, you know, run their scheme and, you know, uh, just once you get to that point, it all doesn't really matter. But at that point in your life, I, I would say, uh, you know, definitely take a breath, soak it all in uh, because, you know, you won't get it back. What uh, what was your initial conversations like with the Browns? What what was that first meeting like? Uh, you, are you talking about like, you know, after before I the drafted? draft? Yeah, prior oh, to the draft. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, yeah. You know, just you know, obviously you talk to you talk to coaches really every day, and uh, you know, we can all kind of struggle together. But you know, basically most of the coaches just they want you they want to see if you can uh, you know remember the plays. They'll teach you some plays, teach you some scheme, then you know talk for 30 minutes and then, you know, ask you to, all right, what's this? All right, if we get this formation, what are you calling this? You know, especially those things are very important, uh, you know, especially for me because I, I'm a Mike and, uh, you know, being able to, you know, do those things right and show that, you know, you have that capacity to, uh, you know, when, when you lose focus to be able to still uh, get everybody on the same page, uh, you know, that's, that's what I enjoy uh, and being a Mike and, you know, I enjoyed that, enjoyed the competitiveness of doing it uh, during the interviews. And, and Jacob, I'd have to look this up, but did you guys still have a pro day at LSU or was that messed up by, by COVID? Yeah, yeah, we didn't have a pro day. So what, what did you, did you guys were able to do anything in the interim to kind of make up for that? Or, or what, what, what were your feelings going through that, knowing you didn't have that, I guess? Uh, you know, I, I honestly feel bad for, you know, some of my teammates who didn't get a chance to make it to the combine. Uh, you know, just because, you know, I know what type of players they are and they weren't able to really showcase their skills, you know. Uh, so, you know, I, I felt for them and, uh, you know, I wish they had that chance and, uh, you know, not having a pro day really stuck, sucks. But, uh, you know, this year, you know, I'm sure every school will have a pro day. Well, and to piggyback off of, of what Gribbs just said, you know, what, what was more important last year, it, at least – what was told to you combine or pro day? What was the, what was the bigger emphasis for you uh, in 2020? Yeah, I feel like the combine is always uh, more important just because, you know, you're there with everybody in the whole nation instead of, you know, just people at your school, you can be the only linebacker in your class at your school, but there, you know, you're competing with uh, everybody else in, in the class and uh, you know, you, I think the I, I mean, I would say that the NFL likes it better, you know, being able to, you know, have an interview with you and then the next person come in who, you know, it's a toss up and have an interview with them and, you know, kind of make their decision upon that. And Jacob, when you're going through the process and it's getting your draft day, what, how much information are you taking in? Are you paying attention to, to mock drafts? Are you hearing where you might be going? I mean, how much are you plugged into that? And if you could do it over again, would you, Pay more attention to it or pay less attention to it? Uh, no, I don't pay attention to it. Uh, you know, really, like, I, would, I wouldn't say that they know, uh, you know, where people are going to get drafted or win. But uh, your agent actually, you know, uh, they, they got the closest ear to the ground. You know, they, they have a relationship with the front office. And, uh, you know, they're getting real feedback. And uh, just because, you know, if you give them false feedback when they got another guy in contract negotiations, you know, uh, they, they might not take it so easy on the team. So, you know, I feel like relying on your agent is the best way to go. Uh, you know, I, I'm with Drew Rosenhaus, and, you know, he has a really good relationship with, you know, all the teams in the NFL. So, you know, I was just relying on him, and, uh, you know, I didn't really look in too, in too much on, the, uh, on, like, the mocks and all that. What would be the best piece of advice that you would give – to uh, say just a linebacker in general that's coming out in this year's draft. What, what would be the best piece of advice? What's the best piece of advice you got? And what would you tell this year's class as, as they prepare here? Uh, you know, that is, is more than just athletics. Uh, you know, make sure that, uh, you know, as you're preparing, you're looking at your old plays because, you know, it's all going to come up. It's, they're going to ask you a random play and, uh, fourth game of the season, a random play in the third quarter, and they're going to ask you what, what defense you were running. And, uh, you know, they're going to they're gonna expect that you know what defense you were in, and they're going to ask your teammates the same thing and, you know, to to kind of see if if you if your answer was the correct answer. So I would definitely say that, you know, go back, watch your games, uh, you know, watch the film, be be real, you know, uh, studious into, you know, the, the schemes that y'all ran. You know, what was y'all's favorite play in cover four? What's your favorite play in cover three? Because, you know, all those questions are going to come up. And uh, if you don't know, then uh, you just don't know. So, you know, I would say go back and do those things.
And for, for to talk into future players, when, when you get in an NFL locker room and when you start going through NFL meetings, when, when do you stop feeling like a rookie? When, when do you, when, and when do you stop uh, feeling like you're getting treated like a rookie by, by the coaches? Uh, really just, uh, I, I say, I say it just comes with just reps really, you know, obviously you want to accept coaching and, uh, you know, accept the criticism, accept, you know, the different ways you can get better, the little small techniques. And, uh, you know, I actually encourage that, you know, I want, I want my coach to, you know, tell me all the little small things that I can do to get better. So, you know, it's, it's, it is different, you know, you might hear one thing from coach and then somebody else in the room, you know, who's, who's a, a vet has a lot of years under their belt, you know, might not hear anything. So, you know, honestly, I, I would rather hear some, but, you know, I, I understand that some players, you know, they, uh, you know, they kind of feel like they would maybe feel like, you know, you were getting picked on in that way, but no, nah, you know, I, I accept coaching and I like it, but uh, I mean, you're going to get that all season, but with the players, you're not going to get it all season. The players, they're going to ease up on you probably around camp. Like once you get to the, to the thick of the season, and like you actually getting in and playing, you know, uh, it's just you you another dude on the team who can help us win. Yeah, pretty impressive. All right, before we let you go, one final thing. What's the number one thing you're working on this offseason in preparation for year number two, Mr. Veteran? <laughs> uh, you know, just there's really everything. Uh, you know, I have a lot of things in my notes, uh, on my phone, things that I want to get better at maybe some things that I, I excelled at this year and did good at, but, you know, I still want to, still want to, you know, fix those up and, and do it at an even higher level. Uh, you know, you know, I know the capacity of players that I can be and, uh, you know, I, I want to put the preparation in this off season to, you know, get to that, get to that point and uh, next year and, you know, help my defense as much as I can and, you know, uh, just be a rock for us. So, you know, I, I'm very fortunate to be, to have been drafted to Cleveland and uh, to be in this organization and, you know, to be on to year two, you know, I have a lot of things that, you know, myself personally, I want to get better at. And, uh, you know, I can't wait to get grinding on. Well, let's hope the weather improves down in Nashville so you can actually get outside and do that. Jacob Phillips, Brown's second year linebacker. Appreciate the time. Wish you all the best in the off season, get a little R and R. And then uh, before you know it, we'll be back here and, getting ready for the 2021 season. Thanks for your time and continued success. Thanks again to linebacker Jacob Phillips for his time. Uh, a kid with a lot of upside and, and Gribbs, one of those kids, one of those gentlemen that had some injury issues at the start of the year and in a non pandemic year can set you back. And in a pandemic year, obviously it, it was a delay in terms of getting going, but once he got going, he really flashed and showed some things. And, you know, there, there's definitely going to be uh, an important role for him to play here in 2021. Yeah. I think he gets you really excited about, he's one of those guys that you look at the linebacking group. There's a lot of question marks going into next year. I think he's maybe one of your only certainties at, at that position where you think he's probably going to have a, a significant role uh, as, as, a, as a main guy. I mean, Mac Wilson, Sione Taki Taki, they'll be back as well, but we'll see what the team does in the off season, but you got to imagine Jacob Phillips is at the, the center of those plans. I mean, he's someone that got better as the season went on while overcoming those injuries. And I, I just think that uh, I'm, I'm excited about what he can do. And, and I think that the Browns are excited as well. I think that that's why they gave him that opportunity late in the season. Yeah. It definitely a player worth watching here in the coming years. And especially in 2021. I'm Jason Gibbs alongside Andrew Gribble. This is the best podcast available. 10 weeks to go until draft day 2021 from right here in downtown Cleveland, Ohio. NFL Combine should have been next week, Gribbs, and you mentioned it in the open. It's crazy. It's sad. It, it, it is sad. We are not going to be in Indianapolis. No one's going to be in Indianapolis. All the pro days and uh, have become essentially mini combines uh, for most of these kids that are coming out. What is the one thing you will miss the most about the NFL combine, Andrew Gribble? Well, I just think it's one of those, it's just a checkpoint. And I feel like we're just missing that this off season. I think we'll have some media availabilities here and there, but 
and then you could kind of keep the, I always like to keep the pro days on like in the TV in the corner, like as you're going through work and you kind of glance up at it and you, you see it. And, you know, we, I felt like we had arrived in the year 2020 kind of understanding that pro days, we shouldn't take very seriously. You know, we, we shouldn't hand ring over who's there, how someone's doing it. We were told these are all staged workouts. I mean, they're set up to succeed. And now we have to go back to caring about them because they're really that that's about it that you have. But as far as like Indianapolis, I think it, it goes that saying, like, it's just a great event for the NFL. It's truly, I, I guess, the Super Bowl in normal years. But we're not a group that has gone and done the Super Bowl radio row thing very often. So for me, it's like the one event of the year where the entire NFL world is basically in one place. And, and Indianapolis is set up great for it. You run into people all over the place. You eat some good food. You 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 get plenty of stuff to, to write about and, and report on. And it, it's usually the unofficial start to free agency. So you, you hear some rumors and rumblings about what's going on in that direction. And now it's just, it's gone. And I, I think it's, it's crazy to look back on last year's combine and really that was the last time everything was normal. I mean, that, that a lot of crowded restaurants, a lot of cl- crowded bars, no one was wearing masks. And, and that was, you come back and within a week, I think everyone, everything was starting to, to get shut down. And I, I think that's where it's, it's crazy that we're now one year basically removed from that, but here's to 2022 and we'll, we'll, we'll hope we'll, we'll, we should be back, whether it's Indianapolis, I don't know if they're looking at other locations, but I think it will be Indianapolis. We keep putting everything else in Indianapolis, like the NCAA tournament's going there. I mean, we're, it's just a good hub. So yeah. I think we'll be back there in 2022. They know how to handle big events. And I know that there's yeah. scuttlebutt because of what they're building out in Los Angeles uh, about, you know, eventually everything moving out there. But you can walk everywhere in Indianapolis. You can get to everywhere you need to get to within 10 minutes. And you mentioned it, like, just finding out little things. I mean, there's everything, everybody from coaches to assistant coaches, to GMs, to owners, to every NFL media person is in Indianapolis for those. And you just learn a lot. You you learn. And then it's, Oh, I need to keep my eye on this. I need to, I heard this and you hear it from people that, you know, know what they're, what they're doing and what they're talking about. And it just, it, it helps you. It's that bridge into the NFL off season. And I, and I think not having that is just, I feel bad for the people in Indianapolis and all the restaurants and bars and hotels and, and all of them. And, but it, it affects all of us in terms of really trying to get a read on some of these players and trying to figure out who, who's in play for who, as we get into free agency and the draft. Yeah. And it's really, it's evolved into more of a, NFL news event as opposed to an NFL draft event because I think we no one really says anything of interest from the coach and GM side in terms of like prospects and and all that stuff I mean it it really is those first couple days especially I mean it's just a big event of news making on the NFL calendar I mean think about it now if we were going there next week especially in Indianapolis we might if the trade hasn't happened yet we'd be talking about like Carson Wentz and, and where he's going uh, or some of these other quarterbacks, Deshaun Watson. I mean, that would be the, all this stuff would be kind of coming to a head where all these GMs and coaches have to talk to media members about it for an extended period of time. So I think it's, it, I know we'll hear from Andrew Barry and Kevin Stefanski in the, in the next few weeks or so, but they do roughly a, a combined two hours worth of interviews when they're in Indianapolis. And, and there's a lot of stuff to glean from those interviews that just, I know they're going to happen via Zoom, but it's just not going to be the same. And I think all these teams are doing it on different days. I mean, the Steelers have already fulfilled their media obligations this week, and we'll see when the Browns do it. But we've already heard from a lot of other teams, and it's different when it's all in the same day. There's just kind of the chaotic, like, just event feeling to it that is just not there anymore. Yeah, no, no question. And you mentioned the quarterbacks on the move, potentially all over the league. Don't forget two years ago, it's where the OBJ scuttlebutt started. Yep. And look at, he ended up being a member of the Cleveland Browns just a few weeks later. Senior Bowl was a couple of weeks ago. Hard to believe, but we were, I think we were seven days removed from, from our, our loss, eliminating us from the season. And then all of a sudden the Senior Bowl was there. And I know that you, you and your crew have done a great job on clevelandbrowns.com talking about some of the players 
uh, that people could watch going into that bowl game. Uh, are there, is there a name or are there a couple names that we should be on the lookout for post senior bowl? As we yeah, there's a couple that I've kind of identified and, and I got to admit, it feels weird that I've now not gone to the senior bowl for two straight years, which is just a, a, a remarkable streak uh, to, considering I used to basically live down there for, for every single year. Uh, but two names that I would think, obviously there were some bigger name players there that are not in the Browns world probably uh, with their 26th pick and, and their lack of need for a quarterback and, and other positions, but two that maybe to perk the ears up a little bit one and you got to pardon pardon me with pronunciation here but the defensive tackle levi on from washington he did not play in 2020 he opted out of the season uh but he practiced one day at the senior bowl and apparently wowed a lot of people there and it has raised the discussion if he is potentially one of the best interior defensive linemen in this year's draft class he had a very good previous year at Washington. Uh, so, and I think the Browns obviously have some questions about their interior, their defensive line going into the off season. Does Larry Joby come back? He is a free agent. Andrew Billings is coming back. What are you getting in him after he opted out from the 2020 season? What is Jordan Elliott going to become for this defensive line? So interior defensive line, certainly a position that could be addressed in the draft. And this is someone who is being mocked to the Browns by many uh, people out there in the mock drafting world at this moment. And he had a good senior role. So that's that's someone that I can say makes sense for the Browns who had a very good senior role, albeit one day of practice, and then he bounced. So yeah. this yeah, smart move. That's usually if you're if you're one of those players that's able to practice and not play in the game, odds are you're probably going in the first round. So you don't need that game. Second player I'll I'll, I'll single out is Western Michigan wide receiver Dwayne Eskridge, who apparently he had a he he impressed with speed, agility, ability to get open. He's only five foot nine, which is a not not very big, but the Browns could use potentially a guy that in the inside at the slot receiver position. He had a fantastic year at Western Michigan, eight touchdowns in just six games. He's someone to watch. He was one of the best wide receivers at the game. And I think with the Browns, uh, you've got Odell and Jarvis back. What Rashard Higgins is uh, going into free agency. We'll see if he'll be back. You've got Donovan Peoples-Jones. I think there's room for a couple more players in that room, potentially in the draft. And Eskridge is maybe someone you could get day two because this is, again, a loaded wide receiver class in the draft where one of the best wide receivers seasons ever, the Heisman Trophy winner, Devonta Smith, I'm seeing mock drafts with him slipping into the, to the, below the top 10. So a good year for wide receivers. You can potentially get one on day two or day three, and Eskridge could be someone – uh, uh, in the mix for the Browns. Two names to watch for sure. Now the senior bowls in the rear view mirror, really the only, the only post championship game uh, of consequence this year uh, in this crazy, crazy off season. All right, before we get out of here on this Thursday, Chad Reuter from NFL.com uh, with his, the first of a couple, I know that he will put out three round mock drafts. Now, this year, the Browns with four picks in the uh, in the top three rounds. Their number one pick at twenty six, their pick at fifty nine, and then their own pick at eighty nine, and the Saints' pick at ninety one. If I've got that correct, uh, Mr. Gribble, uh, in the draft they focused on the following: a linebacker in the first round, edge rusher in the second, corner in the third, uh, with the first pick, wide receiver in the third with the second pick in the first round though he has us trading up five picks with indy to number 21 giving up 26 plus a fourth and a sixth your takeaways uh on this three round mock draft well i think it would be a surprise to many people who think that they've figured out where the browns value positions and draft picks for the browns to trade up to take a linebacker i don't know if i'm among those people but I think there's a lot of people with preset opinions about where linebacker stacks up on kind of your position values. But uh, Nick Bolton, I think, is the player that he has the Browns trading up to get. He's one of the best linebackers in the draft, had a great season in Missouri. Uh, we'll see. Uh, the the trade up is not something you're hearing talked up very much, though, I would say. This this is where this where Chad is kind of on an island here. I just uh, that for, from the past behavior of this 
of what uh, of this front office and, and what you could expect. Would I be surprised by a trade up? Maybe not, but I, I would be. Interested. I would. I would just imagine if you're trading up. I would think maybe a pass rusher or a corner, guys like that who yeah. we've seen are the, those are the the, the money making positions, the, the the ones that 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 truly kind of can make an impact. But again, there's some good linebackers, and if there's a guy that fits this system well, and you you might have to go up a few spots to get him. I don't think I don't think this group would hesitate to do it because I think that they, there are specific traits and skills they're looking for, and I don't think the price to move up from 26 to 21 is all that much considering you got nine picks in a draft after the weirdest college football season ever. I wouldn't yeah. mind parting with a few of those picks. Well, and you might have to get ahead of the Steelers. Yes. Who, yeah. I, who might be picking on the defensive side of the football as well. Something to play. plays. In. Yeah. It was interesting that I had someone ask me about the, the, the linebacker out of Tulsa, uh, Zavon Collins, who's getting mocked to the Browns a lot at 26. It's and, and then all the drafts that don't have him going to the Browns, it's because the Steelers are taking him at 24. So well, the little, little rivalry is going to be going on because there's a lot of similar, similar needs, I would say, for, for the Browns and Steelers on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah. Well, it, again, it, it's early. We're starting to see the mocks start to roll in. Daniel Jeremiah just put one out. And as we get to know, again, as we get to know these players and these names and these faces and uh, start to delve a little bit deeper into their background, then we'll be able to kind of start putting names out there. I, I thought it was just interesting from a position standpoint. Real quick in the final minute that we have, would you be surprised if they went defense in three of the first four picks? It would not surprise me, but it just, it seems too easy. Like, I mean, I, I, there, there's always a curveball thrown on, on draft. I mean, I, I just think that we look at what the Browns have and you got to think, wow, you got to load up on defense. I've had people write to me saying they should use every single pick on defense, which I don't think that will happen. We've seen teams do that. I think the Panthers did it last year, if I'm not mistaken. They drafted uh, all defensive players. So it, it, maybe that happens, but it just seems too easy to do three or four defensive players that first day. Maybe maybe two and two. Uh, I'll go I'll go that far. Because I, I just think there's so, still some areas you can get better on offense. I think you can add a wide receiver. I think an area that might need to be addressed is – if you don't address it in free agency, I think you need another tackle on this offensive line for, for depth purposes. I just think you've got to plan, plan for, for those kind of situations. So could there be two offensive players in these first four picks? It wouldn't surprise me. And I, I wouldn't find it particularly offensive either. Yeah, it, definitely something worth watching. All right. Episode one officially in the books. We're back with you next week, one week closer to the 2021 NFL draft. Make sure you log on to clevelandbrowns.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Like and subscribe today to the best podcast available. Thanks to Jeff McDaniel for his time and putting everything together behind the scenes. Thanks to linebacker Jacob Phillips for his time. Andrew Gribble and I are back with you next week. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening to the best podcast available. <laughs>